Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for sticking around for this last uh, session. And um, yeah, I, I hope you're, you're going to enjoy it. Um, I'm going to talk about Apache Flink and Apache Kafka, um, a bunch of, you know, um, kind of contrasting a bit the philosophies, let's say, between Flink uh, case uh, streams. Um, also, a lot of, you know, the use cases that we've seen over the last, actually, last weeks even, um, where we see, you know, Flink and, and Kafka kind of, you know, pulling the wagon together pretty well, and yeah, I want to share those. I'm going to start uh, just very briefly in introducing myself. Um, I'm, I'm a co-founder of Data Artisans. We're the uh, original creators of Apache Flink. Um, that was around about three and a half years ago. Um, and we're also, we're also offering the Data Artisans platform, which is a, an enterprise stream processing platform built on top of Apache Flink. I'm going to do a very brief introduction to, to Flink. Um, I hope most of you have actually heard of it before, or at least roughly know where to, you know, where to place it. Um, like from a very high level pitch, Apache Flink is a system for stateful computation over data streams. It's not a system to store data streams, unlike you know, Kafka is the log that stores events. It's, it's a system to compute over streams of events. Um, and it, it has a very broad interpretation of that, of that setting, right? It has, um, you know, there's the classic stream processing, real-time results from data streams. Um, Flink's interpretation of stream processing also generalizes well to batch processing and um, to event-driven applications. So it, it really sits as, as the, you know, as the, the processes that orchestrate computation over data streams. It consumes from, from streaming data sources like Kafka or, or you know, other pub subsystems. Um, um, but also, you know, other, other storage systems, databases, um, file systems, and it produces into, into various forms of, of syncs. It's, it has a very flexible sync interface, but, you know, the, the most common use cases that we see is actually producing, again, into things like Kafka, um, producing into, you know, file systems, um, pro-k files for later analysis with, you know, with, with SQL systems into databases or directly calling RPC into applications. Um, again, um, the idea of Flink is really computation over data streams. And um, I'm, I know I'm repeating this, but it's, it's like a very, a very core concept in, in Flink. And the, the interpretation of what a stream is, is is a very broad interpretation here. So everything is, is treated as a stream internally. Um, as a potentially unbounded stream, if you're running um, you know, a continuous stream processing application, or also as a bounded stream, if you're if you're actually looking at a you know a finite piece of data from the past. So, from Flink's perspective, if you're actually running a, a a computational job over let's say a bunch of files that sit in HDFS or S3 or so on, from Flink's interpretation, that is a stream processing job over a bounded data stream. So all these files together just just form a stream from its perspective, and um, you know. Bounded streams can start in the past and extend into the future. Unbounded streams can, can start very far in the past and ex extend infinitely into the future. So this combination of also taking data very far from the past and also real-time data kind of together is, you know, it's very essential here. Um, it is, um, Flink has a bunch of uh, layered APIs which you use to define the, the streaming computations. The API that most folks actually start with is the, is the data stream API, um, centered around streams and windows. Um, I'm going to have an example in slightly larger print than that later. Um, it has an API that's a bit more low level, which gives you very raw access to the core components of Flink, which is events, streaming events, um, state, a very flexible notion of state, state in various, um, in various shapes with, you know, with persistence, exactly one guarantees, and time. Um, I'm not going to dive much into time in this talk. Um, let me just say at this point in time, um, the, the idea of time in Flink is actually, um, it, runs, it runs internally different clocks. For example, a processing time clock that tells you what time is it now, and an event time clock driven by a mechanism called watermarks that tells you what time is it in my data stream. Those can be vastly different from each other. For example, if you're, you know, if you're reprocessing data from the past, you're just, you know, you're just starting a new application and you're still crunching yourself through the data from last month, then the event time clock will be within last month. So you can, um, you can use those to, um, you know, to build applications that take both of these into account. 
And then there's a high-level API on top, which is actually not too unlike KSQL. There's, there's differences in the nuances. It's built on the idea of dynamic tables. So there's, like, we also like this idea of stream table duality. Um, yeah, I have a, a bit an example for that later. So roughly the data stream API, yeah, it's a fluent API. Um, it describes basically streaming data flows. It looks, it looks like you, know, you would you expect one of these APIs to look these days. Um, the lower level API, the process function API, which gives you rather raw access to state, um, you know, allows you to take individual events, put them into state, retrieve them from state, schedule timers into the future. These timers are actually also you know, like persistent callbacks aligned either in processing time or in event time, so you can actually make these deterministic applications that you know, process well even if you're you know, computing through data in the past. And, and on the high level, SQL, um, you know, as, as you know, SQL. Um, I think a slight difference to its case SQL, just to relate to the previous talk, is that um, we, we try to stick with ANSI SQL. And one, one big reason why we try to do this is that um, we're, we're trying to, to bridge a gap between batch and stream processing also with this uh, SQL API. So remember from the past, from Flink's perspective, you, know, you can also treat the past as a, as a finite data stream. So the idea of this uh, SQL statement is if you, if you bind it to a, to a time range that lies in the past and you execute it in batch, the resulting table should be exactly the same as if you actually go through the stream that produced this table from the past, execute it, and keep incrementally producing the result and outputting more and more and more. In the end, they should both exactly arrive at the same result. This is, this is one way to try and bridge the world between you know, batch and streaming in a, in a SQL way. Um, details on that is actually talk in itself. Um, I'm happy to also answer uh, questions afterwards, but um, today I'd actually like to focus more on, you know, like the core of Link itself and a bit of how it, you know, interacts with Kafka. Just to give you an idea of, um, of what, is, what is Flink actually used for. Um, for. For those of you who have followed the Flink news a bit, you might actually know some of these use cases. Um, it's, it's actually being used for, for some, some pretty impressively large use cases that, that still astonish me. When, when I look at them, so um, arguably the biggest user of, um, of Flink that, that we know of is Alibaba. They have, a, they have a slight modification of Flink called Blink, which um, has a few internal patches, but it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly close to the, to the vanilla Flink by now, so they've been contributing back those patches over the time. Um, and this runs, this actually runs their, you know, their stream processing recommendations during the, during the singles day, which is this crazy global shopping festival in China. Um, and you know the, the details are maybe lost here in some of the comments, but they're, they're running stateful stream processing jobs in Flink, which actually have tens of terabytes of state inside the stream processor. That's not working against an external database. It's just like the internal state that you know that you, we actually remember state from events and you know that you use to interpret the next event to contextualize it. Um, other use cases, this use case is not, not large in the sense as it's, it's, as, it's as stateful as in, you know, it doesn't keep the, the tens of terabytes around, but it, it, keeps a, a pretty decent, it keeps a pretty decent event rate. And we already have a nice example of, you know, Flink and, and Kafka working together here. So Flink is used here, that's um, it's a use case from the data routing pipeline of Netflix. It's used here for, in combination with Kafka, to, you know, take the, take the raw ingest stream, preprocess it, um, route it downstream to various systems. You know, S3 for archival, Elasticsearch for search, and you know, further Kafka topics for real-time consumers. So that's basically Flink in the large. I just want to mention that you, know, you don't have to have a thousand nodes to run Flink. You can actually run it in a single process as well. And we are some users that, that put them also on an IoT gateway. You know? If it's just like a single node, of course, there's a compromise in fault tolerance. If that node goes, node goes down, it's down. But you can, at least you can compute on the node. You don't need like a terabyte cluster in order to, to just get started with some stream processing. And it, um, it actually works pretty nicely inside the IDEs for, for debugging as well. Um, so in this talk, I've, I've kind of tailored this talk a little bit towards a Kafka audience. I kind of assume, hope that most of you are, are roughly familiar with how, how Kafka streams works, at least with how I assume Kafka streams works, to be honest. Um, so I, I would like to use this session to kind of, kind of contrast a little bit the, the difference in, um, in, in the design decisions that, um, that we made at the beginning, which kind of, you know, acts as a, acts as a, you know, as a, as a good foundation to understand how, how Flink and Kafka kind of complement each other very well. 
And I'd actually like to start with this um, metaphor, which I think fits the day very well because we heard the, the keynote this morning. Um, this, uh, this metaphor, event sourcing and the memory image, is actually taken from a blog from Martin Fowler. So there we go. Um, you, you can think of that the, the basic idea, when we started to do Flink and we thought of, okay, how, how could you do fault tolerance in a streaming system? Um, we, were then, we were then assuming it's a system that's independent of you know, other logs, other, you know, other message queues and so on. How do you do, how do, you do fault tolerance here? And one, one model that we really liked is this idea of just as, assuming we can replay some of the events because that seems to be quite common. You know, many message queues, and Kafka supports this in a stellar way, but it's kind of an assumption that you can make to work also with other systems. Um, if you actually have that, then, you know, if you, take your, if you take your event log, source the events, and then you have your process, and you just work in the process with your events. You do, yeah, you do whatever, actually, in, the, in that process. You don't really need to worry about too much work, what you do. And then... There's something that periodically in the background just takes a snapshot of the, of the memory of that process and puts it to the side. It should roughly remember, at better exactly remember actually, how, like where exactly in this input event block it was when it took that snapshot. But once you've actually done that, um, when you have a failure, what you do is you can bring that memory image back, replay the remaining events that you had since the last time you took that image. If kind of build a full tolerance system, right? That's, that's more of a theoretical model than a practical one, but that kind of is the inspiration for how Flink works in the end. So that kind of captures one process. Now, a, 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 streaming, a streaming program in the end, you know, if, no matter how you define it, if you define it in a fluent API, if you define it through something as SQL, it usually ends up being a flow of operators, right? You have some sources that, that connect to some source systems that route the events through some, some other operators, shuffle them around, you know, they interact with some, with some storage. Um, they're going to produce some result. So what, what you do need to do is either, you know, if each, if each one of those operators here wants to be able to take this memory image, how do we do that? We could try to make each stage individually replayable, or we could try and say we, we do, the, do the snapshots in a, in a consistent distributed manner. So let's assume we just have our events flowing here, and then... Once in a while, we just sweep over the topology and basically take a snapshot that's aligned across all operators such that a replay from the very beginning allows us to reconstruct transitively all memory images. So, um, and then, you know, if something goes wrong, we can just, you know, restore these memory images and start replaying. And from at the very beginning, you actually need to really replay events um, from the source. So that just means you have to remember the Kafka offsets where you were when you took that snapshot. Now... Why did we? Why were we so keen on, on, on using this as an architecture? So one one thing to to really um, to really observe here is that there's there's no boundary in the flow of events here at all. There's no mini batch. There's no writing writing to some some persistent storage immediately. Um, no replication of intermediate data or anything, right? Which which is kind of a nice property, right? It allows you to get this thing really low, with really low latency if, you know, if your network stack is, is spelled in the right way, and it allows you to do this whole thing with real, really high throughput. And if you remember, we were, we were looking back at this broad interpretation of use cases, batch processing. Right? For batch processing, you actually need to be able to, to, take a, to, to get a system that can shuffle you know, operator to operator, just shuffle through memory and network uh, as fast as possible. You don't want to write to, to disk intermediately. Otherwise, you're in the MapReduce game, and you know, then the next one that is the Spark game, the in-memory to in-memory kind of beats you. So that, that's why we, we, we wanted to say, if we actually want to be able to do batch processing at all, we need to have that in our architecture. We need to be able to do like memory to memory work. Um, so on a failure, you restore these snapshots. Um, I've already outlined that you know, there's no barrier boundaries, low latency is really good, um, high throughput for, um, for streams that you know, go from operators to operators. Um, a very nice property of that is actually makes shuffles very cheap. I mean, you still, they still cost network bandwidth, but you know, if, if, you're, if your network is good, like shuffles are not, you, you have to worry way less about shuffles um, than you, know, um, you may be used to. Um, it, it, handles, it handles large state fairly well because if we actually look at you know, the, the snapshots, what they take, 
they take the they take the size of the state. So the snapshot is always order of, of the state. It's not order of the number of events. And state is typically strictly smaller than number of events. Um, I already said it's something that supports fast batch processing, and it also gives you the ability to support a lot of different types of states and timers because you can you can use fairly flexible data structures as long as you are able to capture them into a snapshot. Now, you may initially think, okay, God, this sounds cool and flexible, but isn't that terribly expensive to do? And, you know, in a naive way, it definitely is terribly expensive to do. Um, so I think for around about maybe, maybe a year, maybe a bit more, um, Flink has this notion of supporting incremental snapshots. So if you actually increase the, the st uh, size of the state inside your streaming application, um, the snapshot st size per snapshot step can actually still, you know, re retain rather small. It's not, it's not always strictly the same. It depends on, you know, how much changed, how much was compacted away and so on. But it's, it's kind of a, a constant small size rather than increasing all the time. And if you remember my previous slide, um, the, the notion of, you know, when you have failure, you kind of restore all, all the entire streaming topology to the previous snapshot. That's kind of a conceptual model. You don't have to physically do it like that, right? Often, oftentimes, if, you know, if only one node crashes and all the others still retain their data, you can kind of, you can kind of do, a, do a soft rewind. Think of it like, like a bit of an, you know, you undo the, the, the changes that you made since the, last, um, since the last snapshot and then just like redo them from there. That's actually mainly done to compensate for cases where you know, there's non-determinism in the program or in the network, which is actually, which is actually a fair assumption to make. And there's, um, there's a lot of, you know, there's internally the whole state support of Flink is based um, very heavily on, on multi-version data structures. So well, we're heavy users of RocksDB and we don't, don't only use RocksDB in, like, in a key value way. We really make use of its, um, of its checkpoint and snapshot feature and, <clears throat> you know, the way that it internally keeps multiple versions, sees if, if there's somebody to still hold on to a version, when can a version be compacted away and so on. And the same thing is also true for other implementations of the state. So there's, um, you know, when, when you don't use RocksDB, you typically use something like an internal hash table, which is a multi-version implementation of, the, of a hash table that, you know, is able to do asynchronous background snapshots and hold on to these versions until we can release them. So this is an in a very interesting model to build a system that can actually, you know, that can, can sustain a low latency and high throughput stack. Um, quite independently without having to make the assumption that you have something like brokers at your um, disposal also to work with. But there's actually a few other things that, can you, that you can do with this, um, with this model pretty nicely. So assume you have a program. It, it, it looked like that. And at some point you say, OK, gosh, um, in order to take the application to the, to the, to the next level, we need, to, we need to modify this program. So we would we'd have to do an upgrade, but because we have a stateful streaming program, we don't just kill the containers and, re and, and start new containers with a new code. We also kind of have to worry about uh, getting the state into the new containers. And maybe, maybe the application changed uh, a little bit. You know, maybe the state is no longer in the third operator, so it now goes into the fourth, or I don't know. So there's a way in Flink, the snapshots and the applications are kind of loosely matched by IDs, and there's certain degrees of, of flexibility you have when you restore a program to actually describe how the new program should resume the old snapshot. So you can start to, you know, within reason, um, modify the program and actually restore the snapshot to that program, which is, a, which is a very interesting feature when it comes to, you know, like evolving programs over time, evolving them in a stateful fashion, not, not losing state. Um, this is especially helpful, actually, in cases where um, you may not be able to just like rebuild the state in your program by reprocessing because your input um, because your input doesn't have infinite retention, or you know because your input doesn't did some events of your input that matter in the state have exceeded the retention period. So that's actually especially for use cases that have a very high load on you know on Kafka topics. Um, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting case because you do have you will have a limited amount of you know retention and. You don't have to. You don't have to um, worry about not being able to rebuild the state if you can, you know, like carry the state from one application to the next with the help of a snapshot. So a, a common way that we see um, the snapshots being used is folks just, you know, while they run the streaming application over the over the stream, just periodically take those snapshots kind of as an as an archive of what did the application look like at that particular point in time. And um, these archives can be actually fairly interesting. So for, for the sake of this example to make sense, I'm actually assuming that you know, we're still within the retention period of the stream in, here in Kafka. Um, if you then figure out, let's say, a day or two later that you know, there's something that, that was happening here 
that, you know, there's an incident of interest. I don't know. There's maybe a bug that you want to debug or, I don't know, you made, you made a decision that you think you shouldn't have made and you want to figure out why actually did you make that particular <coughs> decision. Um, you can take the latest prior snapshot, create a modified version of your jobs, say something that, you know, filters ex out exactly a specific user ID um, and runs it through a separate path to maybe output more trace output, you know, or more debug logging more than you can, you know, let, like in your live production, um, afford to make, because otherwise you just like overwhelm your logging system with all the uh, detailed information about every event. So you can take, you can take this particular job, um, resume it from that snapshot and say, run it, over, um, ru run it over a bunch of events from the past. Again, this, makes, this, this example assumes that at least for that amount of time you still have, your, um, you still have the events uh, retained in Kafka. Um, another th thing that could be interesting is, let, let's assume that your event stream actually looks more like this. It's not, it's not strictly a continuous stream of events. It's nice to think about it as a continuous stream of events, but it just happens that you work for an industry where things happen end of day, largely. You know. And you can, you can run a stream processing application, but it's, there's a fair chance it's going to idle 20 days, uh, hours of the day, and then it's going to go really hot um, for four hours of the day. So you could go and say, I'm, I'm, I'm running this application, and at a certain point in time, when I'm, you know, end of my hot period, I'm taking a snapshot to shut this thing down. And then I'm restoring this from the snapshot, you know, running it again, I'm shutting it down with the snapshot. And you do this again and again and again, and what you kind of have is almost like a, like a batch job, with the nice exception that you've actually modeled it as a streaming job. So you don't really have to worry about um, how, do you, how do you care, let's say, in-flight stuff, like let's say, whatever, transactions, that, transactions or trades that haven't settled exactly on that date, that kind of need to be carried into the, next, um, into the next side. You don't have to really worry about what happens with the boundaries of the batch jobs, right? It's, it's still conceptually a streaming job, continuously. There's no, there's no interruption of state, there's no boundary to worry about, because everything that's not been fully, that's not been fully resolved between here and here is, is, is exactly what is part of the snapshot, what you restore into the new applications, all the pending sessions. So, um, so much for, you know, why, why is it interesting to actually build a stream processor based on, you know, such a, such a model like flowing events and snapshots. Um, I want to spend a few words on, on saying how we actually integrated Flink and Kafka. There's, there's a few interesting, there's a few interesting um, at ch challenges in there that, you know, at the very end, I can actually, if I have a bit of time left, I'd, I'd like to dive into some of the technical details. Let's see if we, if we get to that. Um, on, the, on the reader side, actually, we've been working with Kafka since version 08. Um, very early on, I um, had, a, had a reader that provided exactly one semantics. The checkpoints in Flink actually um, checkpoint the Kafka offsets. So whenever Flink internally commits a checkpoint, that's for, its, it, it, for Flink itself, that's the point where it says, okay, these are the offsets that we resume from. It commits them back to Kafka if you want to, but because, you know, to really have atomicity, you need to have you need to have like one atomic kind of commit operation that at the same time just the snap the, the offsets and the and the state. So we kind of had to move that into Flink. Um, over the over the last versions, it had like the Kafka reader has gained abilities for you know dynamic uh, topic and partition discovery. So you can give it um, give us a certain string where it, it periodically pings the brokers and picks up new partitions and new topics that you know make that, uh, match that expression. Um, we've actually, um, you know, Flink is fairly frequently used um, also to consume multiple topics within the same reader. So that's, that's one of the, of the ways that, for example, um, Netflix uses Flink with Kafka. They, they spread their load over multiple Kafka clusters for various reasons, just to keep, to keep the, I think, the load and the number of partitions of one Kafka cluster sort of under control. And then, and then they cannot use Flink to bridge between the different Kafka clusters. Um, and um, another thing that, that we've integrated uh, in the past is actually to make uh, the Kafka consumer, um, to make the Flink Kafka consumer aware of the individual partitions and tracking watermarks individually per partition, which is pretty, pretty important to get correct event time results if you have skewed distribution across partitions. On the writer side, we've also been working with a few versions, and the, I would say the most interesting addition has been the exactly once producer ever since um, Kafka 0.11. Um, I have details in a later section. It's actually kind of a, fancy, a fascinating integration, I think, between um, checkpoints acting as a, something like a non-blocking two-phase commit coordinator for transactions that you know, Flink orchestrates in Kafka. So it uses the Kafka transactions, 
but because it has a slightly different um, different model there, we kind of we, we need to needed to do a bit to bridge this um, to bridge this world. So you could you can think of it roughly like if you know how how two phase or three phase commit works with with distributed databases. Um, it's a, it's a little bit like that. Uh, just that you know the individual operations are, are non-blocking; they're not blocked on voting delays. We still, <clears throat> Flink will just roll over the Kafka transaction, start new transaction, and as soon as the checkpoints start to acknowledge it, will it will commit them, and it will you know take care that if there's failures in between, it resolve them will resolve them properly, even either in an abort or in a commit, depending on you know whether this is a as a correct checkpoint or it was a an, an aborted checkpoint. So some interesting use cases. How is Kafka and Flink used together in what we see? So it's actually used together a lot. I would, I would actually venture to say that for Flink applications, probably Kafka is the most popular source together with, together with file systems like HDFS and S3. So HDFS S3 for static data, Kafka definitely for dynamic data, and by far. So very often we see users building applications like that, Kafka, um, Kafka topics, Flink applications between the topics, producing downstream into you know, more Kafka topics, being again consumed by a Flink application, producing into more Kafka topics. So kind of chaining these um, streaming, streaming applications together. Let's, let's make a, a few very concrete examples. And these are, these are actually taken mostly from, um, from presentations and, and, and other conferences where uh, users spoke about Flink and Kafka. So we already had this one here, um, data streaming, um, data stream parsing, and, and routing. So Flink basically taking the raw data from Kafka and distributing it across different systems. Um, with the, you know, I think the feature that, um, that they really liked here is the ability to directly produce into various different systems um, with good consistency guarantees from, from Flink directly. Um, these streams are extremely high load, so you know every every intermediate topic that you put them to is is actually is actually costly at this point here. So this was um this was a very um this was a feature that they liked a lot. Um, what we're seeing, especially in the uh, in the recent weeks and months coming up, a lot is actually more uh, machine learning pipelines. This is a, maybe I should actually switch the slides. Let's actually start with that. That's the simpler example. Um, that, that's an example from, um, from Uber looking at um, like machine learning based real time optimization um, that takes you know, a lot of different things into account. Um, uh, this is used for, for various different things. I think the example they were mentioning in this talk was uh, estimated time of arrival models here, which, they, which is a pretty essential thing you know, for, um, for, for the planning of rides. So um, it's, a, it's, a fairly, um, it's a fairly classic online, offline um, solution for, for machine learning. You have the initial raw events coming in through Kafka. Um, you have some form of ETL process getting them into a data warehouse. You have an offline job that, that um, does model training and that has a set of model features um, that, it, that it produces. And then you have a, a real-time job which you know, does the the feature preparation and then um, actually takes this takes this model to to make the real time decision and yeah and decide what to do with that particular event. Um, this this case here is a little more um, a little more a little more complicated because it um, it's not it's not just such a such a strict um, division between offline and online online learning. It has a lot of uh, functionality also on the online path where. Um, you know, where certain features are, are gathered on the fly or updated on the fly, and you know, there's like happy paths and fallback paths depending on you know how the, how does the features and the models currently look like. So various different you know different routing strategies depending on on where data comes comes from. But we're, we're also seeing again here there's a there's a feature store for the you know for, for some offline trained models. There's the online uh, firehose of events coming in, and then there's there's just a slightly more complicated logic in the in the sense of where does the you know where does the where does the resolution go depending on you know like the uh, the quality the freshness of the model? Um, wh one thing that we have actually started to see a lot, and I I would personally say that's that's because the streaming system is getting is getting actually more mature is um, real time and historic uh, combining real time and historic data. So I think when we were talking with users maybe a year ago or so at um, yeah, at at our at conferences and so on, a lot of them were like very much talking about what do I need to do to get stream processing in production and so on. And 
and, and this is actually something that's sort of come up over the last months, which, which is something that you worry about once you actually have stream processing in production. Um, and um, it's how do you actually take your, you know, your real-time events, often um, in a messaging system like Kafka, um, together with you know, all the old data, the distant past. And, and very often, these, these actually live in different systems. So there's the real-time data in Kafka that be hours, days, um, months, depending on, you know, depending on your data rate, um, the capacity of your brokers. Um, but, you, but almost always, eventually, there's some bulk stored involved. So data ages out of Kafka. Um, maybe not every event, per se, but a bunch of events is, is often then ingested, let's say, in a, in a compressed format like per K or C or so, into a bulk storage. If you want to, if you want to do this, this, this nice thing of you know, you just interpret everything as a stream. Let's let, let me start with you know, let me start with a new application. Let's say it's a recommendation model, and and I, I don't want to do this whole offline online kind of thing. I just want to I want to buy into this everything streams philosophy. So I just say yeah, I'm, I'm I'm writing this application. I'm just starting it at the beginning of time. And it's going to crunch through all the historic data first, and while it does that, it's kind of building its recommender based on these events. And at some point in time, it's gone through the past and it's kind of caught up with the present, and it's going to work on the live data. So it's actually going to output, um, um, output predictions and you know, keep updating the model with the live data. So this kind of means that you have to, to sort of form a stream that, um, that starts with the data, in this case in S3, and then switches over to, to data in Kafka. Or kind of, yeah, it's a bit, a bit of a concatenation. It's, you know, if the data is, is small enough, you may say, yeah, what the heck, let me just re-ingest it. But from a certain data size on, you might not want to do that anymore. It might not, be an, uh, might not really be a feasible or efficient thing to do. So this is actually taken from a, um, from a talk from, from Lyft um, uh, two weeks ago at the Flink Forward conference where they were explaining how they actually use Flink to do this um, to do the boot, they call it bootstrapping of state. So state being the, you know, state being the stored context in the stream processor, be that the recommender model, the user sessions, the counters, metrics, the state. And in, in this, in, you know, in this slide it says kinesis, but images as well read Kafka there, you know, like these things. For, for the sake of this example, they were pretty much interchangeable. Um, We've heard actually about CRS, CQRS applications um, earlier, earlier today. And there's a very nice example. It's actually a company from London. That's why, you know, maybe even someone from them is here today. Um, it's, a, it's the way of building a social network over, over data streams with uh, Kafka as the, you know, the event lock, the source of truth, and Flink being the state of the world materializer. And they've, they've, really, um, they've really illustrated very nice in, in a series of blog posts how they, how they do that, you know, with... Um, with some, you know, some, some shared log where you have a, a blue and a green variant that independently compute states of the world and you can mess with one side, um, see if you can tweak things and if it's good, then you throw the load balancer that way and if it goes bad, you throw it the other way. So, um, you know, it's, it's very close to what we heard this morning in the keynote, you know, like how does event streaming actually help you with A-B testing and so on. It's kind of, yeah, that in essence. Um, but we also see the, the combination of, um, of, of Link and, and Kafka being, being popular is um, when, when you need kind of sophisticated time semantics. So sophisticated time semantics, what do I mean with that? Um, Apache Flink implements a very much the, um, the data flow model that you, know, that you may know if you followed some of the blogs from the Google data flow folks from Apache Beam, which gives you a configurable trade-off, the watermark between um, event time uh, and processing time. I like to phrase it usually the other way around. That, um, I'd like to say the watermark is a configurable trade-off between data completeness and, and latency. The further you always in, in real-time processing can kind of torn between those two b between those two sides. You may want to hold it back just a little bit longer because you might get a more complete view of your data, some more events that are actually relevant to this particular decision. But then you might not want to hold it back too much because. Otherwise, you're going to violate your SLA. But you also may not want to emit each intermediate state because it might just be meaningless at the beginning. No? There's a certain point when you say, OK, from now on, it starts making sense. But how much longer do I really want to wait to, to get a good trade-off between throughput and latency? And that kind of configurable trade-off between throughput and latency, that is, the, that is the mysterious watermark in stream processing. So when, when you actually do... Um, so Flink has actually a way to, to work with these watermarks, and you can use them in you can use them in very in very flexible ways. You can actually do very low latency um, watermarking implementations that you know run in actually 
run in the tens of milliseconds in, in this specific example. Um, this is from, from a presentation from ING about, um, about the, the feature. As, that's, I think that part is the feature assembly for the fraud detector um, that, they, that they run. And yeah, so one other, one other part where we see, we see people really like Flink is the idea when you, when you start to, to want to keep really um, large state in the stream processor. I have a few more minutes left, so let me, let me quickly um, talk about an, uh, an outlook, like what are we working on at the moment, and then maybe, maybe dive a bit in the, you know, the snapshot and transaction integration. Um, one, one project that, um, that I, I personally really like and can get excited about is um, this, uh, this collaboration between Flink and Beam in, in opening up the, um, the ecosystem to a few more programming languages, right? So um, stream processing, you know, if you're Java and Scala developer, chances are you're, you're in good company. If you're a developer in Python, maybe in Go, it's kind of it's kind of tricky, right? So the idea of this um, of this project is to build a language portability framework um, uh, within Beam and um, use this to plug in languages like Python and Go. And it has kind of a, a very very interesting architecture based on you know, like co-located containers and so on, which allows these languages to run without the compromise of um, that. that that we are otherwise very often make, you know, all the heavy lifting is still done in the in the in the JVM, and the it's only a very lightweight SDK that runs for this specific language, which makes it both easy to add more languages, and it means that you know you don't have to really worry about maintaining large state in Python or in Go or making sure you get the time semantics exactly right, like in like in the um, like in the Java implementation. We're about to release one Flink one five. It's been it's, it's been a few weeks of release process and, and a few release candidates. It's a pretty big change that we, that we made to Flink, um, a big change to the process model um, where we want to better support both uh, framework style and library style to integrate with, um, integrate with stream processing because, and I have to actually go back to the beginning again, you know, with this interpret broader interpretation of streaming that we have, more like event-driven applications um, and batch processing, um, there's really no clear way to say this is how we want users to interact with it. We want them to think of it as a library, or we want them to think of it as a framework. They're really good cases for both worlds. Like, it really depends on, on exactly like, what your philosophy is and what you want to do. And we've gotten this as a feedback whenever we said, like, oh, we actually want to switch it to that one. No, for that one. So we kind of reward the model to, 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 come, to, a, to come to a way to actually support all of those, all of those um, modes. Um, there's a, a lot of stuff going on. You can actually see there's quite a bit of stuff that we're still doing within Flink. Um, we're, still, we're still doing improvements to the network stack to say, you know, under certain forms of back pressure, we can uh, guarantee better throughput and latency and better uh, checkpoints. Um, we can get faster recovery of large state and so on. So this whole, you know, this whole work on the, on the snapshot model is very much still um, being improved. But the, at the same time, we're also working quite a bit on, on more API features like managed broadcast state, interactive SQL client, and so on. So it's still an ongoing journey. Um, that's it. Thank you very much.